Welcome back to our video. Um, we're going to move on to simplifying and rewriting. So some, some types of equations that you're going to see. I'm going to do a, an example that has just the identities. Um, what happens when you have to factor out a value? What happens when you combine fractions? And what happens when you eliminate fractions? So if I was rewriting and simplifying, what if I just wanted to recognize, hey, there are trig values I see. Now, when you guys get to the point where you yourself are verifying, worst case scenario, if you can't do anything else, focus on getting everything to look like sine and cosine. This one's already set up as sine and cosine, but that's my like fail safe always. Whenever you're doing any sort of rewrite, simplify, verify trigonometric identities, the biggest fail safe is get everything to look like sine and cosine and go from there. But in this case, I already have sine and cosine. And my little peanut butter and jelly guy, he was supposed to pop up earlier, but whenever you see this, this literally just means, hey, just because I solve it one way does not mean you can't solve it another way. As long as we're getting to the same end concept, then we're doing it correct. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. And I look at one minus sine squared and I see something I recognize. Hey, Anytime I see a square or I see a one plus or minus, this should flag in your head the Pythagorean identities. Why? Specifically, if it's squared, then it's probably already set up to be a Pythagorean identity. If it was just one plus sine x or minus sine x, then I can conjugate. And we're going to go over that in just a second. I can conjugate so that I can create the Pythagorean identity. So anyway, it's already set up. One minus sine squared is actually equal to cosine squared x. Now I have two cosines up top and one cosine down bottom. Hey, I can get rid of one. And now I'm left with simply cosine of X. And guess what? That is my end answer. If I tell you to simplify and this is what you got to do, then your end answer is more than likely a single trigonometric value. It might be one plus cosine X or something like that. But more often than not, you're going to end up with a single trigonometric value when you are rewriting. So, ta-da, there's my answer. What about a different one? Oh, hold on, before I move on to a different one. How can I prove this graphically? Well, I showed you in Desmos, you can prove it for yourself, but here I have plugged in one over cosine X times one minus sine squared, and over here I've literally plugged in cosine X, and look at that, they're exactly the same. Here again is proof and verification. Could you have solved this graphically? More than likely not. You may or may not recognize it just from the graph, but how do you know you're looking at cosine? How do you know you're not looking at sine? Blah, blah, blah. You never know, right? So proving it, the only way to really prove it is to do it by hand. Proving it graphically is just a verification after. All right, so here's example four. Peanut butter and jelly tells me you could have solved this a different way, but I've got this value. I need to simplify it. Again, a lot of trig, and I want to get it down to one, maybe, maybe two, but one trig. Okay, so... What do I see? Hmm. Well, I've got tangent. I could get rid of tan. So there's something I could do there. I also see a repeater factor of cosine. So I could also factor it out. I also see a squared. So I could use the Pythagorean identity. See how I mean peanut butter and jelly? A lot of different ways. Any one of you could have started and set this up. But for this purpose, I'm going to go ahead and change tangent to its uh, quotient identity. Sine divided by cosine. Well, hey, if I have a cosine in the numerator and a cosine in the denominator, I get to cross those out. So I end up with this. Ha, huh, I have another repeater, sine and sine. If I divided by sine, I'd be left with one minus cosine squared. Well, that means it's a factor, sine times one minus cosine squared. Cool. Hey, I see another squared, Pythagorean identity. Miss Jag, we're talking about all the things we saw. Look at that. So there's a Pythagorean identity. So I can replace that with sine squared. One sine times two sines becomes sine cubed. Ta-da! That's my end answer. So that's all I would answer. If I had to write this on a test, I would show all of my work, and my end answer would simply be sine cubed. And look at that, one trigonometric value. Let's prove it graphically. So on the left, I have cosine x tan x minus sine x cosine squared. And on the right, I literally have sine cubed. Same thing. All right, let's try something a little bit more complicated. What do we do with fractions? This is the one that a lot of kids get messed up with. But just remember, when you're doing fractions, you need a least common denominator. That means the denominators have to look exactly the same. Nine times out of 10, you're going to have to make them look the same. And we're probably going to end up using a conjugation. In this question I'm looking at, we are going to end up using a conjugation. So I have this. 
and I recognize, hey, these are gosh darn close similar, but they're not quite there yet, right? I need them to look exactly the same. So I'm going to multiply by their conjugate. And a conjugate is simply, uh, you know, if I had 1 plus x times 1 minus x, what ends up happening? You end up with 1 squared minus x squared. So I'm going to end up with 1 squared minus secant squared, but I'm going to prove it to you. So I multiplied the negative by the positives, and I multiplied the positives by the negatives, and here's that breakdown. 1 minus secant squared times 1 plus secant squared, and over here it's the same, but I've just switched the parentheses, okay, becomes 1 first, outer positive secant, inner negative secant, last negative secant squared. These cancel each other out, and I'm literally left with the first value squared minus the second value squared. That's what a conjugate, that's the property of conjugation. Use it. You don't have to prove all of this every time because at this point you should recognize this is what's going to happen each time. It's a pattern. Okay, so now I end up with 1 minus secant squared, and I recognize, hey, that's a Pythagorean identity. How? Because of the squared and the 1. Okay, so I recognize that this is negative tan squared x. Plug that in. For those of you who can't see what happened from previous to here, this whole bottom became negative tan squared. Eek. This became secant plus secant squared. This became secant minus secant squared. This whole bottom became negative tan squared. Okay, so let me show that to you. Ta-da! Same thing, right? But now because I have a least common denominator, I can put them together. And now because I can put them together, I can go ahead and cancel some stuff out. Common misconception part, a lot of kids would put the negative to this negative secant, but would leave this negative. Because I put parentheses, am I going to see that this negative now distributes and this negative becomes a positive? Because I put the parentheses, I'm going to see it. Make sure you're doing the same thing. Always, always, always use those parentheses after a minus. It'll help you see where that negative happened. If you don't want to use the parentheses and you do it in your head, great. But I'm just giving you that hint. That's where I see mistakes happen pretty often. So these secants are going to cancel out, but these are not because this is not secant squared minus secant squared. It's secant squared plus secant squared. So I end up with two secant squareds divided by negative tan x. Well, hey, hold on. What did I say? When you rewrite and simplify, you probably want one trigonometric value. So is this good enough? Maybe, but could I get it better? Let's find out. I recognize that I have the reciprocal function on bottom, right? That tangent x is actually, well, cotangent, sorry, one tangent x becomes that cotangent flip. So I can bring tangent on bottom to cotangent on top. And then I recognize that I have both the reciprocal and the quotient function. So I go ahead and replace and look what happens. My cosines are going to disappear. Um, for another P way, peanut butter and jelly could have seen this. This could have been two secant squared x over uh, sine squared, cosine squared. And then you would have realized you're going to reverse these anyway. So it's, you know, same concept peanut butter and jelly different way. So now I end up with this one over sine squared, which is cosecant. And ta-da, I have one trigonometric, trigonometric value. Ta-da. Now let's do one more where instead of um, multiple fractions, you have a single fraction, but you need to get it where you don't have a fraction. Cool. So I've got this information on the, on the top. I see a squared. Cool. That could be the Pythagorean identity. I also see sine. Cool. That could be the reciprocal identity of cosecant. But on bottom, I see the setup one plus. Hmm. If I conjugate, does that mean that there is a Pythagorean identity on bottom? There sure is. So that's actually where I'm going to start. You could have tried a different way. Go ahead and show me. That's fine. But I'm going to go ahead and conjugate, which means instead of multiplying by 1 plus, I'm going to multiply by 1 minus so that I can end up with 1 squared minus cosine squared. Hey, look at that. That's what I ended up with. On top, though, I end up with this sine squared times 1 minus cosine x. It's up to me whether I want to leave it like that or not. I like to do things little by little just to kind of see what's happening with these so I can really pick up on a pattern and I don't miss a pattern that might get me stuck. So on the bottom, I have my Pythagorean identity. I go ahead and change it over. See, look at that. If I had already multiplied this across, would I see that these two are going to easily cancel out? Maybe, maybe not. So it's probably smart to leave it as its multiplication. Now I can cross them out and ta-da, I end up with a single 
trigonometric value. There might be a one in front, but there's a single trigonometric value. Ta-da, it's that simple. All right, there's your chance to stop and do a question and we'll come on back for our last one.